Okay, well, good morning, everybody. My name is Ben Slang, and I'm the Membership and Business Development Associate uh, here at the Digital Supercluster. I'm pleased to welcome you all to our webinar on data licensing and artificial intelligence. Uh, so before we get started, we respectfully acknowledge that in Canada, we live, work, and learn on the unceded territory uh, of the traditional ancestral lands of Indigenous peoples. So as myself and much of the Digital Supercluster team are based in Vancouver, British Columbia, we are gathered here on the uh, territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil tooth peoples. And we encourage you all to take a moment and chime into the chat uh, just to let us know that uh, what uh, traditional territory that you are joining us from. Uh, as a reminder, this webinar is going to be recorded and it will be distributed to all registrants afterwards. And if at any point uh, you do have a question during the session, please just hop in the chat and let us know and we'll be sure to address them at the end uh, during the Q&A portion. And so with that, I'm going to pass it off to Jen, our IP manager to kick things off. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, bonjour everyone and welcome. Uh, it's wonderful to have attendees joining in from across the country in the last of this year's series of IP focused uh, sessions. Stay tuned for more on what's being planned for next year. We're excited about that. Um, and for today, whether you're new to the supercluster or a returning face, we're thrilled that you could join in for this power hour. Next slide, please. There are unique considerations related to licensing and using third party data or data related services for machine learning, which organizations of all sizes and sectors need to be aware of and the increased risks and regulation when licensing data for AI or receiving or providing services related to data collection or annotation. Over these next 60 minutes, the discussion will include key licensing considerations, data management and governance approaches organizations can consider, and a close look at the Montreal data license, which was uniquely developed by presenters at this session. Its general framework will also take a look at, along with the benefits associated with the standardized licensing model. A Q&A portion will close us out, and we encourage you to post in the chat as we go through this session. Next slide, please. A foundational component of the supercluster is collaborative innovation, setting the framework for projects that address cross industry challenges while creating technology products that can scale across industries and ultimately across the world. The Digital Supercluster's IP strategy supports the development, ownership and retention of Canadian IP through a number of vehicles and informational sessions with industry thought leaders, such as the one we have today, are but one example of that. Next slide, please. I have the pleasure of introducing three exceptional thought leaders with us today. Please join me in welcoming Misha Benjamin, Paul Gagnon, and Jade Buchanan. Misha is general counsel at SAMA, overseeing all legal aspects of the commercialization of their software and services for annotating, training, and production data for AI, including IP strategy and protection, and has also developed their ethical AI guardrails. Prior to this, he was Associate General Counsel for McKinsey and Company's Digital and Analytics Division, where he helped develop risk guardrails and oversaw contractual discussions for software-assisted advanced analytics and AI engagements. At Element AI, he was responsible for shepherding software from research to com commercial deployment and formed the company's position on issues such as IP rights in data and trained models. He has spoken extensively on all issues related to AI as well as on the intersection between IP and data. Paul is Assistant General Counsel with Tega Motors, a manufacturer of electric off-road vehicles and pioneer of the electrification of power sports. A member of the Quebec Bar, Paul also holds a master's in biotechnology and law and a master's in intellectual property law and competition law. In 2020, he was listed in the IAM 300 as one of the top 300 IP strategists in the world. In 2022, he was named one of IFLR's rising stars in the Americas, which is recognizing exceptional contributions to the practice of law. Co-author of the Montreal Data License, Paul regularly gives conferences dealing with legal issues arriving from AI, data licensing, and intellectual property, and has practiced with a national law firm, as well as in-house with Cirque du Soleil and Element AI. And last but not least, Jade. 
partner at McCar McCarthy Tetro in the cyber data and technology groups, and is ranked by Chambers as an up and coming leader in privacy and data protection law, and was recently in the Global Data Review's 40 Under 40, recognizing the best of emerging leaders of data lawyers globally. Jay has worked on some of the largest cybersecurity incidents in Canadian history and has extensive experience in advising in retail and technology sectors, public sector, and banking and financial services. A certified information privacy professional, he is also speaker on technology, privacy, and cybersecurity, and has been a guest lecturer at the University of Victoria and Osgoode Hall Law School. Wow, are we ever in for a fabulous discussion this morning. Thank you very much, and without further ado, Jay, I hand it over to you. Thanks, Jen. I'm, I'm, I'm a best of thought haver, but I do appreciate that. Um, so I, I invite anybody uh, on, the, on the webinar to please ask questions as they come up. Otherwise, you're going to spend the next hour watching me uh, ask whatever questions I want of, of two very bright lawyers. Um, I will ask the first one, but I'll be keeping a close eye on the Q&A. So I'd like uh, Paul and Misha to start today by framing our conversation around the Montreal data license paper and generator um, and, and just kind of pass it off to you to give us the background of how it came about. And the important thing I, I think we can we want to touch on is this idea that we don't always have clear language and defined terms to talk about data licensing and um, training AI in a way that makes it easy to have these conversations. So I'll pass it off to, to you two. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jade. Um, so thanks a lot for having us. Um, this is a very interesting conversation and we're, we're always happy to talk about it. Um, and I think that, you know, to start off answering that question, um, to give a little context in, you know, 2017, we were working with Element AI and one of the key inputs for the models that we were developing was we didn't have enough data. And there were a ton of sources of data that were on hand that we didn't know exactly what we were able to do with. It. So for instance, we kept getting requests from uh, people internally saying, you know, we have this open source data set that says it's available, let's say for research use, what can we do with it? Or, you know, we have custom, we have access to customer data that we're analyzing for that given customer. What happens if we train a model on that data, what you know? What can we do with that model? Are there certain things that we can or can't do? Um, can we use that model for you know another customer, right? And the fact was, both the both sort of from the generally available data side and from the customer side, the language that people were using to describe rights and responsibilities related to that data didn't anticipate the this issue of training a model on that data, and then that model having value separate from that data. So Paul, maybe you want to give a few examples of that? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so as Misha mentioned, uh, you know, the, the question we were answering quite often um, is, is in the house council at Element uh, was, was, can I, you know, can I use this? And from there, you know, the, the, the dialogue that, that began, whether it was with uh, more the fundamental researchers or more product or commercial context that Misha mentioned was, well, what do you mean by use, right? And so from there, you know, there was, um, there was just, we realized that part of the problem was really that word, using, right? So for other types of, of uh, works or context, you know, the law sometimes gives us an indication of what the different permissions to grant are. Copy, and I'm alluding here to copyright law, right? Which tells you within the act, very specific things that, that, the, the, that the author or the rights holder has the, you know, has the rights to allow or, 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 in case, and, or not permit, right? So in the context of AI, what we realized was that use was kind of a bit, um, a bit of a misnomer, right? So the starting point was to say, well, why don't we break it down with um, the different steps in, in um, you know, AI projects and focus on that, um, on that framework and that language. So basically the goal of, of the Montreal Daily License, the underlying paper was to find those right steps and define them. Uh, and in that we weren't, we weren't alone. We worked uh, closely with, uh, with the team of scientists that was, that, that was at Element AI um, Negar Rostamzadeh, Chris Powell, Yashua Bengio. So basically, 
you know, folks that could help, um, and they're all co-authors on the paper, of course, to, to, to create this taxonomy around what does use mean in AI. Um, yeah. So, you know, to, to give an example of what those different steps are, one of the things we heard from the research team a lot is um, they had a model that they wanted to try on a data set. So they didn't know if this model would be helpful for a given problem or not. They're not looking to commercialize it, uh, but they just want to see, hey, can this model work on this type of data? So that is one use that we identified as being important to AI researchers, and we call that benchmarking. So essentially, you know, can you uh, train a model on that data, see how it performs, and then delete that model? And you know, that's less problematic for a data, data licensor than saying to someone, well, yeah, you can use this, you know, you, you can use this data for anything you want, which includes commercializing. Uh, commercializing your model and potentially undercutting my own market. So in the benchmarking scenario, they're creating a market for the data licensor by saying, you know, this actually worked great with this type of model. So uh, people who want to do this type of project can come to you and license that data for, you know, general use. Whereas, you know, the use without restriction would completely undercut the, uh, the data licensor's market because they could just sell a model instead of selling the data. Yeah. And conversely, you know, you look at, at the at the academic um, context of, of using data and more often than not, you know, you'll find uh, people publishing based on, you know, benchmarks to known data sets, right? So in that context, it's a completely different kind of use case, right? You're just looking to publish based on performance on data. Um, and so, yeah, so basically that was, that was kind of the, the, we did, I think, two big things with the paper. The first was develop this taxonomy and establish it. And the other was kind of poke around with issues that we had seen in data licensing, uh, certain limits of, of language that we'd come across. And, and, and basically, that was, uh, those were the kind of the two big pillars around that, that work. Yeah, so I think to, to hone in on that, one thing that we've always seen is problematic um, in advising people whether or not they can use open source software is you know, for example, the research purposes limitation that we see often in open source software, where, you know, does that mean I can do internal research and then develop a product based, uh, based on it? Uh, is it academic research only? What if, you know, originally it's used for academic purposes and then that research is spun off or licensed, you know, patented and licensed out of the university? So there's just a real lack of clarity in some of the um, open source frameworks that existed. And even more so when you took that level of abstraction of, you know, you might no, you you might no longer be using the data, but a model that's trained on that data, you know, should be the, the use restrictions should be tied to the the restrictions of the data itself. So for yeah. instance, yeah. if you had uh, under the traditional license framework for open source, if you if you had data for research purposes only, that would in no way stop you from doing research on the model, training that model, and then exploiting that model commercially, as long as you're not using the underlying data for that commercial exploitation. So that was a big limitation of the open source framework as you know, not seeing uh, or trying to apply something that applied to software to something like information that doesn't have the same copyright protection necessarily. Yeah. And I think like one of the ways to, to if any of the attendees, you know, or coaching teams or themselves having, you know, these kinds of questions, you know, the starting point is, understanding as an assumption that because something is available doesn't make it usable right and this is something that you see quite often when you know these days it's more around large language models but any kind of open source framework a lot of times when it comes out of big labs you know they'll probably say they'll proudly say but probably say here we're making it available to the public which is true technically but when you look at the licensing language behind it it has important use restrictions for example, it will say only within academic research. Obviously in, in the field of AI, part of the issue is that this, this academic research sometimes is collaborative between industry and academia. Sometimes it's actually full on, you know, uh, industry-based work that is published and participates in this academic dialogue. Um, so you'll see this with either the models themselves or the underlying data sets, right? Like, oh, and by the way, if you wanna do your implementation, here's a subset of the data to benchmark and, and try your implementation of this model. So when you look at that context and you put yourself in the framework of even just supercluster related activities, right? You're going from 
cross academia to industry collaboration, sometimes, you know, even just within a university context, that is spun out and goes somewhere else, right? So this was a problem with these kind of use restrictions that are context-based because that context changes. So if you develop something in academia and it's relying on stuff that has these use restrictions that are either unclear or later become clear when you're further down the line, um, you know, we, we, those problems are, are, are pretty apparent from, you know, kind of standard uh, language that you see associated with, uh, with open releases of via data or, or models themselves. And, and so just to make this like very concrete too, um, you know, what we ended up doing with all of this is creating um, a license generator where you can go in and answer questions regarding what you want people to be able to do with the data and the models trained on your data and click, you know, yes, they should be able to do this. No, they shouldn't be able to do this. And it'll create license text for you. Um, and I think the, the link to that is probably shared uh, in, in the materials to this. Um, but, you know, to anyone who found this, um, you know, who hasn't been dealing with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis so far and, and found this a little abstract, definitely encourage you to go in and just look at that link. And I think it gets everyone thinking about all of the different ways that data can be exploited or commercialized in the AI context. And, you know, thinking a bit more granularly about what you should be allowing, what you shouldn't, and thinking through sort of all the steps of AI deployment. So we, we're starting to get a couple questions, which is great. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to try and uh, uh, there is a question about the 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 website, which we'll we'll provide uh, the links if we haven't provided them already. We'll make sure we provide them after the session. Uh, there's some questions that kind of merge with some of the things I was going to ask about. So I'm going to go with the one about health data um, first, it, 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 and in the context of you know if if I'm an organization and I've got I think I've got big data sets and I want to start monetizing them by licensing them to um, researchers or companies that are training AI. Is there, you know, if that market exists, what are the things I should be doing? Let's assume it's um, a range of data, but let's include health data as a subset of that. Yeah. I think the starting point for any of these conversations is, is data, we, we look at it in a very, generic way, right? We say training data, but obviously underlying this is, is there's so many different rights involved. So with this question, we're touching upon privacy related rights. Um, if there's any additional or follow up questions, we can gladly talk about, you know, other rights at hand like copyright or lack thereof, but let's assume health data. First and foremost, you know, you're looking at a framework that is changing very, very quickly, right? It's increasingly being harmonized with European legislation arising from our free trade obligations. Um, it's being enforced in, in varying degrees. But on the other hand, when you look at research data, you look at different government initiatives that show that they want to also create value out of this, right? Um, right now, the federal you know, discussions, the dis provincial federal discussions are talking about increased data sharing. Um, Obviously for industry, it's not entirely clear how proactive or not that's going to be. Um, all that being said, and it's a long-winded intro for sure, um, what can we do? Well, you can obviously you know, take all of the reasonable steps you can right, to anonymize this kind of data with health data that obviously that has certain limits inherent to what you're going to do. Um, so from that, you need to understand that as the person, if again, it depends if you're the one gathering this data and then making it available. What you need to, to, to ensure is that downstream that these obligations are complied with, right? So if ever you're going to share with a partner, it can be about understanding what kind of IT infrastructure they have in place to make sure that appropriate security standards are there, right? Um, but beyond that, uh, it's also how you can make this data available, right? Like the pure transfer, be it in, even if encrypted, right? It creates a trace. So when you're working with privacy related information, you also have to realize that um, reforms are increasingly given more rights to data subjects, right to modify, right to delete, 
um, the right to correct, which has been existing for quite a bit, but there's more, that framework is, is, is growing and gives more control to people. So what that means is downstream, you have to make sure if you do get a, date, a request to delete records, that has to flow through to others who have it uh, as well, right? That's your responsibility when you're in that part of the, um, in that part of the ecosystem. So um, it's 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 a tricky uh, it's a tricky world, but I think that governments are are realizing that uh, there's a lot of value to be created out of it, and and so it'll be interesting to keep monitoring um, yeah. how that evolves. Yeah, and I think one thing that's important, like one thing that you allude to that I think you should apply in a bunch of different ways is that downstream control, right? <laughs> so, you know, one, you have to look at what your obligations are now and make sure that your licensee is going to be able to comply with them as well, because those will sort of follow the data wherever it goes. Um, and, you know, the the obligation to delete or, or correct is a great example. Um, but it also has to take into account future obligations. So if there's a decision that comes out that says that the obligation to delete also comes with a retraining obligation of the model trained on that data, that's something you have to build in a mechanism for. Um, and the other thing is you have to make sure that the purpose that you're licensing the data for is the only purpose that they're using it for. Um, so you have to make sure that there is that can sort of continuous chain of those obligations related to that data. So, you know, once again, this brings us back to um, limitations on, let's say, combining data sets, annotating data sets in certain ways, and also um, training models on that data and then using it for a different purpose. Or, um, you know, having a secondary purpose related to the purpose that you're allowing that wouldn't be subject to those obligations because you're not using the data itself. So let's say you give <clears throat> you give someone a right to access data in order to create a you know, hospital management AI model. Well, you have to make sure that that doesn't include the right to, let's say, create a representation of that data that they could use for another purpose. Or um, you know, use the embeddings of that model for something that they're using elsewhere. <laughs> like, so it, it's really about circumscribing the rights that you're giving, not on just accessing in a certain way, but also thinking about what is created based on that access and making sure that all of the obligations are going to throw, flow through to everywhere that they need to go. Uh, because eventually you're going to lose control over the representations of your data if you're not thinking through those different steps. There's some more uh, good questions coming through the chat, including one that I'm going to save um, towards the end because it's kind of a fun takeaway. Um, there is, so I was going to ask about um, some of the things that you think that data licensors or data licensees aren't thinking about or don't foresee when they enter these into these arrangements that they really should. Yeah. Um, I think Misha alluded to this, but it's looking at that relationship in time, right? Because we often look at data access and licensing as a punctual thing, or, you know, sometimes a one-year thing, maybe it's part of a project, but organizations should really, especially those that rely on AI built systems or those that want to productize it, should think about data access with a longer term perspective, right? Because, you know, phenomena like uh, data drift, you know, model accuracy, things change, right? So the underlying access to the data that you're using day to day uh, to power those models, you, organizations should think about what happens if they lose access to that data. Do they have equivalent substitutes? Does that mean massive retraining that comes with a pretty big cost or bandwidth that the teams might not have? How are they making sure on a day to day or month to month or whatever basis that um, they retain this access uh, or at least have an ability to, to 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 bring that data back in to make sure that you know it's sound and it's reliable and it's representative, and so contemplating what happens if they if they lose a relationship, a key data relationship, how do they mitigate that risk? And that involves really like I guess the starting point of my question is not looking at data access as a punctual thing, but as a a longer term business relationship really. Yeah, and the the other thing I would add is. <clears throat> 
thinking about where regulation is going and what that's going to mean for the relationship between the data licensor and data licensee. So, you know, for example, and this has always been best practice, but the so the the fact is, for a long period of time, when you're getting access to data, all you cared about was you know a representation that they had the right to give you the data, and then it became sort of the data data licensor's problem if that wasn't the case. But that's really changing, and more and more we're going to see people who license data be responsible somewhat for the limitations of the data they're using. So for example, you know, trying to get information about, right, and the representation, the representations should still stay and data licenses should stand by the use that they're granting data for, but understanding where data came from and what the limitations of the uses are, trying to get information about how the data was collected and what that means for you know, blind spots in that data or edge cases that might not be in there. Um, and getting that, you know, not just on a case-by-case -case basis, but having a, a real framework for understanding those limitations and then bringing those people in to understand what that means for the rest of your model development process to make sure that you're addressing those limitations. And I'm saying this because a lot of the regulation is converging towards what in the EU is being called conformity assessments, uh, in Canada is uh, AIA, so algorithmic impact assessments. But at the end of the day, and this is where I get back to this should have been best practice and is best practice anyway, is when you don't own, like gathering, annotating, uh, understanding data is such a key input to the AI development process. And if you're not, building in an obligation for the data licensor to uh, participate in that in a meaningful way, you're not going to be able to comply with your, let's call it AIA process, because you won't have key information and that'll taint sort of the, the entirety of the process because data happen, like the, the data part happens almost at the beginning. And so I think that's key for the licensors and for the licensees expecting to be brought in as part of that. And, you know, like, let's say for instance, saying, Hey, look, if you have to release a report, you have to one, let me participate in that because it's going to sort of reflect on the quality of my data and maybe indemnify me <laughs> uh, because it can, you know, it, it's a developing process. We don't know what it's going to cost. Uh, probably also give me the chance to, you know, contest that certain things should be in there uh, because some jurisdictions are moving to making this information public. Um, so I think on both sides, people just aren't thinking about that step yet but it's going to be pretty key going forward paul with like yeah where it gets interesting is is like four or five years ago right when we were tasked with with negotiating with data vendors um starting to think about these kinds of things it was very foreign to them um obviously the bigger data vendors that like their whole business model relies on this right of commercializing data uh even before the age of ai or like in in fields where AI was commonplace, like financial services, for example. And when we would negotiate reps and warranties with them, so the guarantees around the data, we would say, well, uh, the data can't have any salt in it. But salt, right, is, is techniques where vendors will kind of sprinkle in a bit of, um, of either false data or little cues here and there to make sure that they actually retain control over the copies of those data, of those databases and data sets, right? Uh, kind of like uh, book editors will slip in typos to distinguish between what edition of a book there is, right? Uh, so data vendors do this all the time, but like when you're training uh, AI systems and like obviously those that are deployed in, in the more sensitive context, right? This kind of stuff, you don't want it. So negotiating stuff like that with data vendors is very uh, interesting because at the end of the day, like, you know, you're working with attorneys that, that know their products and then you're saying, well, look, like some of these protection mechanisms you have are like really not great from a scientific standpoint. So we need to kind of work work with you guys to negotiate this out. Um, it was not always successful, but it was always interesting. It was always interesting. <laughs> so I, I'm hearing like, if you're an organization and you want to license your data, this is not passive income. Um, this is a... it, yeah, I mean, it, it always depends. Right? Oh, lawyer's favorite answer is it depends, of course. <laughs> but, but, but I think, you know, 
understanding what it depends on and taking that into account is important. What one one L, one approach could be to say, well, you know, no matter what, you're just going to pay for my time if I'm involved in this. That could be an approach, but you always want to sort of understand what the actual use is, and that'll help you understand what the level of risk is for licensing that data. Because for the same data set, depending on the risk and depending on uh, the jurisdiction, although jurisdiction is becoming sort of less and less relevant, um, the, the, the level of risk and the level of effort can be completely different. And that also sort of brings back the importance of circumscribing the license related to a specific use. Because once again, you know, if you're licensing it for a very low risk use, then you could probably let some of these protections go and build that into your pricing. And if all of a sudden it's being used on something diametrically different, you know, th those costs can add up very, very quickly if it's not something you were expecting. Paul, I had one quick question for you um, on the, the concept of data drift. Can you, can you just explain that as a risk um, if you're licensing sure. data? Yeah, I mean, in, the, in its simplest form, it just means that the model's accuracy or the representations that the model makes of data in time faced with new data, its accuracy lowers. So that's what they call data drift, when basically the, the new data that it's seeing produces a different output than the one it was trained on. So basically that's kind of naturally occurring phenomena, right? Where you might have, uh, you might have, you know, training data that's from a certain segment in time. And then, you know, COVID happened and all the data has gone really askew and, and you have to retrain based on the fact that, you know, the model no longer represents um, the phenomenon that you're trying to measure against. So you'll see this, like, you know, I think the easiest way to look at it is prediction models where, the, predict, the accuracy of a prediction just completely changes based on new phenomena. So you have to retrain to make sure that your model kind of keeps predicting accurately um, what it's seeing. And that is a, a very, it's a lawyer's explanation of a very uh, technical uh, term, but I, Misha, anything to add on that one? No, I, I think that, that nails it exactly. I think like a really easy way to understand it is it happens even in language, right? So. Everyone can be doing everything right, but the evolution of words just changes over time. This is one, one form of data drift, but easy for, for everyone to understand that, let's say the word sick used to mean like bad things. And then it became like, could be bad and good. And then COVID happened and it's usually bad again, right? <laughs> <laughs> so just, you know, it's not that it's something that you should be guarding against in the sense of contracting around but just that the data access is necessary on an ongoing basis, or you at least have to understand the limitations if you don't have that data uh, so that you're ready for that data drift when it happens. Yeah. So from a commercial standpoint, like if your organization's relying on AI-based systems, if you look at normal standard software as a service uh, contracts, so cloud contracts, right? So basically what you're expecting is for that system to be up. Right. So what's more often negotiated is service level agreements, SLAs, that tell you, all right, this system is going to be accessible to you via the cloud for 99.9% .9 of the time, except when it's not. That's usually the first version of the, the service level agreement that you see. And then you find narrow exceptions, except for planned maintenance, except for, you know, what, what have you. So this, this is an SLA for a cloud-based system that no AI component to it. So when you're talking about different AI systems, having it available might not be enough, right? So a true service level agreement for an AI system might integrate different metrics around accuracy because it's not just that to have a bad system or a system that's not predicting accurately available isn't enough for your organization. You want both, right? Um, and that's where there's additional tweaks to the normal kind of playbook for, for software as a service contracts. Yeah. And I mean, it's even more like, I think we're often talking right now about the relationship between data licensors and data licensees. Um, but when you bring in sort of the third party, let's say of a, um, you know, an IT consultant that's helping you, that's helping you build and deploy a model that you might not understand completely, where that IT consultant's expertise is key. That's when you really have to be thinking about retraining. So, you know, and this is very specific to that 
you know, the model and the, the data and everything, but understanding in that particular context, what happens when something changes, how is it going to be detected? And, you know, is there an obligation to come in and retrain it? How often does that happen? Um, and like, you know, talking about scheduled or unscheduled, like sometimes it's because meanings of word, words changes or, you know, the economy changes. And sometimes it's because within the company, you start using a different form. And that could completely change the way the model's operating and you need to bring someone in to retrain. So, you know, getting out of that pure licensor licensee relationship, that's really something that if you're bringing on someone to help you deploy, um, you know, let's call it proprietary technology, it's a really key consideration that a lot of people don't consider up front. So, uh I'm going to ask one more question that I've got that's sort of relevant to one that's in the chat before we, I think, go to just pure chat questions. There is a question about the impact of um, the proposed Bill C-27. Uh, so those of you who uh, are following along at home, that's the federal government's proposed replacement for PIPEDA or privacy legislation at the federal level, to which they've added um, the Artificial Intelligence and Data Act, uh, which is a bit of a shell of legislation governing AI. Um, but you've talked a few times about how this is cross-border and global and how uh, you often can't just look at one jurisdiction. So I, I, we can talk about Bill C-27 as much as you want. Um, we'll see people drop off, I'm sure. But um, so as governments kind of make their way into regulating AI in more of a global sense, I'm wondering if you can talk about some of the problems you see with existing incentive structures and how you see government regulations improving or potentially making them, them worse. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm going to jump into this. Um, I, I, I think it does make sense to address it more at a global level than a Canadian level. And it's not just because, you know, it's not because we're Canada. I think no matter where you are, you have to uh, be looking at sort of what the highest standard is. I think we all saw it with GDPR when that came into force. Um, everyone very quickly, I, generally, most people very quickly uh, started using that as their, their guidepost, even if they were in jurisdictions that weren't covered by it or covered by it yet. The fact is, you know, generally people aren't developing software for one market. People aren't using data from one market. Uh, data subjects can be protected by more than one law at a time. Um, and it's just really difficult to parse out sort of, like if, if you start having different infrastructure and different practices for different jurisdictions, uh, that can be very difficult to handle. Um, at the same time, especially in AI, and I find this a little encouraging, is that there's a lot of convergence uh, between the emerging regulations at the moment. Um, you know, we could tell that people are, are talking, and I think it's a, it's a good thing because, you know, it's one thing if you have one standard that's a little higher than the other. Uh, if you have two standards that are just different, it becomes really difficult to, to comply. I think what's great about the emerging regulations is that um, it is sort of imposing some of these best practices that I, that I talked about, about, you know, doing a proper impact assessment that, that is risk-based and takes into account the ultimate use case and the, the ultimate, the ultimate impact that the AI system can have, um, on individuals. Uh, so forcing people to go through that process, think about it a little more, document it, bring in lawyers, um, although that has obviously ups and downs as well. Um, but, but really think about the, um, every step of that development process and not just the ultimate, what is your model doing or not? I think that's a really welcome development. Now, it's going to be really interesting to see how this is both complied with on the company side and how it's enforced on the regulatory side. I think there is a level of expertise that's required on both sides um, that right now sits with a very small subject subset of individuals and it's going to be really hard to comply with at a global scale in the immediate future um but you know i'm, I'm glad that the pressures are there to develop that skill set and, and implement it <laughs>
nothing to add on that one. Well said. <laughs> but but I think you know at, at the same time like the especially in health, however, um, you know you can't just say well oh the the EU is has the highest standard so we're going to comply with that. Um, there are particularities, especially on the privacy side and especially in health. So less as they relate to use with AI, I think in general, um, that like you, you still have to be very familiar with the different national legislations that apply when you're using health data. I think that's really important. And, and those, the markets are more fragmented as well. So that's when you see, you know, systems that are specifically developed for a given country and data sets that are pretty clean of other countries' data sets because of the way that they're gathered. And that's just rarer. And it's it's because of the way that that market works. I'm, I'm going to cheat and ask one kind of follow-up question on that. With governments as a sort of having access to, if not actual possession of significant data sets, are you seeing them get proactively involved in making citizen data available for, for AI research, for training models, et cetera? Um, closest I've seen is uh, in Quebec's privacy reform, there is a clear volition to, uh, to make that kind of data available and for research purposes, right? And again, so it shows that we're hitting some of the same conce conceptual walls that we kind of, with, with the Montreal La data license wanted to kind of step over because again, right, it, 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 though the initiative is there, it doesn't necessarily bring that clarity as to what is possible or what is impossible um, to use, right? How do you use that data? So it's, this, it's the very same question. And, you know, conversely, based on, you know, the risk assessments you have, if you're like, if you have trained models, um, that's trained on very, very sensitive data, you know, you have this risk of if you if you deploy it live or just give everything to someone else and give everything here is a very much a shortcut, um, you're still right, there's still that thread of, of GANs coming in and reversing back and reconstituting the initial data. You know, opinions differ on how much of a risk that is, but you might not want to allow that, right? Um, and so if you're, the, the person responsible for that data set, if you're using the Montreal data license framework, you go up to a certain point of permissions you can grant, but that you stop at, you know, sharing the trained model, right? So what that means is you can, someone could commercialize it behind, you know, an API or commercialize it in a way that, that reflects that risk um, that is not giving access to the fully trained model to someone. So, um, yeah, that's really the kind of granularity we had in mind so that people could decide based on the risk that they see, what kind of permissions should flow through. Um, and quite honestly, I think, you know, if there's one thing I would change about the whole framework is I, I think I'd call it, you know, the, we'd probably call it like the data and model framework. I don't think we, I think it, it goes a little bit beyond just data, right? It's also what you do with models trained on that data. Also, licensing is probably a misnomer because it's hard to license information, but that's, that's a very technical legal question that we don't have to get into today. <laughs> well, the, the first question at the top of the chat is on IP. So if we get into sort of the IP rights and data sets, uh, so be it. But the, the questions from the perspective of a smaller startup um, developing their own IP and product um, for future licensing, the question is when should we start engaging with legal um, for legal documentation or potential IP protection? Yeah. Um, it, it's funny because me and Misha were, we were in private practice at some point in time and, and, and Jade, you, you probably have as good an answer as, as, as we would on this one, right? Like the easiest answer is early and often, but obviously there's a cost for organizations to do that, uh, especially when it's out of pocket, you know, finding the right expertise, but um, as a smaller startup, like you should be thinking about this day one, right? Um, if you're trying to raise money, you'll be asked about how you're protecting your IP. Uh, that's that's the core of it, right? That's what uh, a lot of the company valuation comes from. So, uh, you know, that's, I think the starting point is that. What to keep in mind, and I think that's like kind of one takeaway is that uh, it, it all depends on what market you're looking for, right? Are you going to find like, a, is, your, is your strategy to have like, 
a one size fits all that many, many people will use, or are you going to target a few different um, clients? Or are you willing to work with just one or two? Like, and those things drive a very, very different uh, approach to, to contracts and how you'll, you'll manage that. Yeah, and I mean, the, the question goes beyond, the IP protection, I think Paul answered it 100%. Um, you know, the documentation, I can't insist enough how like early you should be looking at that because the fact is it's easy to give away the keys to the store by accident if you don't really understand like the, the nuances between, let's say, access, licensing, ownership, um, and, you know, how those can be terminated or not. Um, and there's great resources for early stage startups on contracting, especially like IP protection can get expensive very fast. Although having a vision of where you want to go early on is important, or at least what the triggers should be for investing in that more. But I think having sort of a a good understanding and a good template that's adapted to you for licensing out or se like selling your service or se licensing out your product is really, really key. And that's worth, and it, it's not as expensive as let's say patent protection, um, but there's huge value there. And if you do it, like make sure you don't just get the template, make sure it's one, it's adapted, but two, you understand sort of where pushback might happen and what the consequences are of some of those changes. I think that's really the key. I can add, I mean, the Supercluster is a one source of resources. There's a lot of organizations throughout Canada that are there to help startups understand IP. And it's, it's a perennial problem in Canadian public policy, of course, that we generate a lot of great IP and then do not protect it adequately. Um, I'm not saying anything new. It's, it's a cultural shift that is, you know, the super cluster is a part of making happen um, so that, yeah, we're not giving things away. And I don't know why it is if we, we just are not as litigious. And so we think legal matters are less important or there's some kind of politeness thing around not wanting to <laughs> around patents, but um, I just, yeah, I make a plug for this, for the super cluster and resources that are available. I, I think it's also, you know, we have less VC money available, right? And it takes, it costs a lot of money to protect these. And they're conversely, the patents are useful for those reasons. And so, you know, we're like, we spend less on that because we don't have the money. I think that's changing a little bit in Canada too, um, at least like the, the level of VC investment. Um, so, you know, maybe we'll see more production, but I think that remains to be seen. So the next question, uh saying great content so far, so thank you. Um, so from, I'm just gonna read it verbally, word for word. From what I'm hearing, the boundary between all caps data and all caps model is actually porous as opposed to the, the idea that sees. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So happy to, <laughs> happy to jump into this. I think it's a great question. <laughs> we're, we're uh, kinda, this, I, it's something that one. like, there's other conversations that we're having that hopefully we'll, we'll sort of plug this. Um, Montreal Data License doesn't close that gap on the licensing side. So we, it's, it's tailored to making available of data only and not making, avail making models available. What it does is if you use a model to, um, if you use a model trained on that, if you train a model on that data, then restrictions apply to the model. And that will that's true as much for, let's say, a representation of the data as an operating model trained on that. What it doesn't do is treat, let's say, models as data um, for things like, you know, and now there's 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 things related to this now, but uh, people who used uh, open source software as data to train models, uh, that wasn't addressed by the existing models. If there was a portion of Montreal data license attached to those open source licenses, then it would have addressed that issue. Yeah. And it, it ties back, this question ties back to another question a little bit further down about uh, compatibility of different licenses, right? Two questions down, similar lines. And, and these are really, really great questions. Um, uh, a lot of this we discuss in the paper. I, I hope in, in relatively clear terms, but look at 
uh, this question about license compatibility, right? So this was a big issue that you, we see this issue in open source software without an EAI component all the time, right? You're, we're taking five, six different bits of software that have different licenses and building a product out of it. The question is, are these licenses compatible? And that question has been looked at for open source software, I think with relative clarity, right? We know the copyleft family of licenses around you know, GPL and so forth. Those are usually thornier. And then we look at the more permissive licenses like MIT and BSD, and we're like, okay, fine, this works. Um, this isn't the case, right, with um, with data and models because it gets a little, it gets even dicier because a lot of the data is not even using standardized license terms, and then when it is, it's a bit weird to incorporate those concepts. And I'm glad that the Creative Commons license came up because Creative Commons licenses are licenses that are for copyrighted works, right? So photographs and uh whatever more of the artistic domain than the technical one but people are using those licenses for data all the time uh if you look at the share alike one uh, so what a creative commons share alike license says if you build a data if you build a broader database based on the these uh, based on the data that's licensed under this you must share alike so the broader work that you're doing needs to have the same license right so it's kind of like a copy left effect or some people call it a viral effect basically the license contaminates the rest in course terms in in the paper we actually discuss how this can be gamed completely uh in in the training process so let's say that you have 10 data sets and only one of them has this share alike um, component you would just train it last, right? Your model by that time uh, will will have learned from nine data sets out of 10 and therefore will not be, or is unlikely to be a derivative work of that first one. But if you train it first, then you know what is the legal impact? And obviously it's a bit tongue in cheek as an example, but it shows that the intent of making data available can't be gained by training sequence, right? It, it's a bit of an absurd result. So that kind of shows like that was one of the examples that we had in mind and we discussed in the paper where we said, look, this is why it makes no sense. Um, but the question of license compatibility is, is, is really a fascinating one. Yeah. Um, and it really goes to, to show that having a very clear framework, I think, helps a lot um, to, to better understand it. Yeah. And I would say, you know, 99 times out of 10, if you go by either copyright law or um ex you know existing uh open source software licenses the answer is going to be no that license does not apply to the set of weights which you know as as it's mentioned here could be considered data in and of itself yeah but exactly but that's it that's why you have to think through that that sort of downstream control but and again you know like some of these licenses are 30 40 years old right they're not yeah. some of them aren't even they're barely applicable to modern programming languages, let alone, right, like very specific AI use cases. So definite need for a refresher uh, there. And there are some cool initiatives doing that. I mean, the, the Montreal Data License is one. Uh, Hugging Face has some cool initiatives as well. There are, there are rail licenses. So, yeah, you know, hopefully, you know, a few years from now, it'll be very just as clear now if you say, Oh, it's Apache 2. Every engineer knows what they can do with it. Hopefully, down the line, if you say either MDL commercial use or whatever rail uh, commercialization, people will know exactly what that means and, and will have that clear understanding. There, there are loads of questions and only six minutes left. So um, I thought I'd give you, each of you just a minute to say if, you, if you've been reading the questions, if there's a, one, one more thing that you wanted to to mention, um, Paul, because you're on the top of my screen, if you want to go first. Um, I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually thrilled with these questions. I wish we had more time. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I guess like one takeaway is that, uh, this is, is, as you, as I hope it was clear to participants in the last, uh, hour or so, it's a very layered conversation. And it all depends on what part you are like in that ecosystem um, from providing data to third parties with C27, that's going to change. That's going to bring different responsibilities for folks all the way down to you're a quote unquote normal organization 
that is working with AI vendors. There's a lot of different layers to this um, around the broader theme of data. And, and I think just to, to the fact that attendees are here, I think is great because it just shows that trying to bring in awareness and, and understand a little bit more of those challenges. It's a bit, a bit of a kitschy takeaway, but I'm leaning in. Yeah, I mean, I guess my takeaway is, you know, it, it is a very constantly evolving space. Um, I think the best thing that people can do is look at the best practices in terms of AI impact assessments, in terms of getting a broad stakeholder group involved in sort of the nuts and bolts of the entire AI development chain in your, in your company. And, you know, you might not own all of the steps of that chain, but at least understanding, um, you know, from A to Z, how it works, what the, who the different uh, exactly not are, like who are the different people who are going to be involved in that process internally and externally, and just figuring out how one stage sort of affects another and what the key concerns are for your use cases in each of those stages. Um, so, you know, obviously <laughs> happy to plug Sama here as well saying, you know, generally a lawyer won't necessarily be looking at to what extent um, the data is being annotated, who it's being annotated by. Were there SLAs for that annotation to make sure that the um, th that it was done properly with an acceptable level of accuracy? Were there feedback loops for the annotators to flag if they're seeing sort of edge cases or something that's weird in the data? Like that's just, you know, for, for one very small step, all of the considerations that someone should think through. And you can't just look at the ultimate result and you have to have sort of different stakeholders throughout. Lawyers especially need to be brought into that process to understand what's going on. And I think it's important for people to start documenting that that's being done if they're in high risk industries, because that's where the regulation is going. And that comes with its own set of challenges because if you're saying, you know, if you're documenting within the company saying, well, you know, we have X and Y edge case, but we think that overall um, this model is ready for deployment, there's obviously risk related to that. But at no point is your model going to be 100% perfect. So it's a series of trade-offs and sort of growing the muscle on how to talk about them, how to, how to use privilege to talk about them in a smart way. Um, but really like how to evaluate, talk about and decide on those trade-offs is going to be really important as we see more, more scrutiny over the overall process and more remedies for people who have an adverse outcome because of interaction with AI. So I'll close off by saying, uh, the paper is excellent. Uh, Montreal data license paper. I'd recommend anybody who had enough interest to watch this webinar to go check it out. Um, it talks about a lot of like recurring problems in data and technology law, um, going back to at least the start of my career and, and likely way before that. Um, so uh, thank you, Paul and Misha. Like that was excellent. I hope you, we'll get a chance to get together and talk more about this because there's obviously more interest and more to talk about than we could fill in this hour. Uh, I think yeah. I think I'll pass it off to to Jen. Thank you so much, Jade, Misha, and Paul. Definitely um, a great discussion. And so yeah, we'll 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 look to try to do a part two, keeping the conversation going. Um, and just a reminder to the attendees that we will share out um, the recording along with um, a link to the tool as well as to the paper. So we'll get that out to everybody. Um, and also, um, if possible, we'll try to see if we can get our panelists to, to answer a few more of the questions, at least to point you to some of the additional resources and things that have been covered here, um, just as you kind of are starting starting on your journeys or sort of depending on where you're at to, to point you in the right direction. So um, on behalf of the Supercluster, I'll pass it off to Ben um, to close us out, but also really wanted to sincerely thank you all for coming. Um, and also to everybody that's joined us today for your really great questions um, and, and the dialogue that we've had. So thank you for making the last of the series in, in, in 2022 a fabulous one. And we look forward to, to welcoming you in 2023 for the continuation of our IP webinars. Over to you, Ben. Thanks, Jen. Thanks so much to, uh, to all our panelists and then all of our attendees as well for the excellent questions and participation. And as Jen said, we'll be sure to try and get a few more of those questions answered in the follow-up email, along with some of the other resources that uh, were mentioned throughout the webinar. So 
thanks again, everybody. And I hope you all have an excellent uh, rest of your day. Thanks, bye.